Haggai, chapter 1. There's only a couple chapters in Haggai, and so we'll look at chapter 1 today, and next time we get together, we'll complete the book by looking at chapter 2. And so let's just read beginning at verse 1, and I'll read to verse 6, and we'll get into our study. Haggai, beginning in chapter 1, at verse 1, reading to verse 6. In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but do not have enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves but no one's warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. So we're going to have a real fun time going through Haggai. What we'll do at this moment, and it's going to take a few minutes to do this, I'm going to lay a solid foundation prayerfully for us, and it'll be prolonged in my introduction, but it's necessary in order for us to, to get an idea of what is taking place here in the book of Haggai. Haggai records events in the life of the nation of Israel. And these events that he's recording uh, occur in the year 520 before Christ. When you look at the book of Haggai, it only has two chapters. But in those two chapters, Haggai gives four prophecies, all occurring in a four-month span. Now, in order to understand what's taking place, I'll give you a bit of a background. The nation of Israel had been held in captivity in Babylon for 70 years. When you read uh, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, when you read the Kings the, and uh, those Old Testament books, especially 2 Kings, you see that the king of Babylon had conducted a series of invasions and had uh, decimated the nation of Israel. God had brought judgment on the nation because the nation of Israel had broken his law. There are two basic things that he brings judgment on the nation concerning. One is they neglected what was called the Sabbath years. And the second thing was that they had turned to idols. You see, in the ne neglect of the Sabbath years, they were disregarding what God had commanded them in the Old Testament. In Leviticus, for example, chapter 25, verses 3 and 4. God had in his law said to the nation, for six years, sow your fields, and for six years prune your vineyards and gather their crops. But in the seventh year, the land is to have a Sabbath of rest, a Sabbath to the Lord. Do not sow your fields or prune your vineyards. Well, Israel had not kept that requirement. And so part of the reason for the judgment was because they had refused to keep the Sabbath years. So the result is that God brings judgment on the nation. Uh, Jeremiah, writing in 627 to 580 B.C., Jeremiah writes in chapter 25, verse 11, this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall, shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Well, that takes place through Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. In 2 Chronicles 36, verses 17 through 21, God brought up against them the king of the Babylonians, who killed their young men with the sword in the sanctuary and spared neither young man nor young woman, old man or aged. God handed all of them over to Nebuchadnezzar. He carried to Babylon all the articles from the temple of God, both large and small, and the treasures of the Lord's temple and the treasures of the king and his officials. They set fire to God's temple, broke down the wall of Jerusalem, 
They burned all the palaces, destroyed everything of value there. He carried into exile to Babylon the remnant who escaped from the sword. They became servants to him and his sons until the king, kingdom of Persia came to power. The land enjoyed its Sabbath rest. All the time of its desolations it rested until the 70 years were completed in fulfillment of the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah. And so God brought judgment through Nebuchadnezzar because they did not rest the land as he had commanded. They also had become idolaters. Once again, Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 11. Jeremiah said, Has a nation changed its gods, which are not gods? But my people have changed their glory for what does not profit. And so they rejected keeping the Sabbath, the Sabbath years, and secondly, they entered into, into idolatry, and for that they were judged. Now, God had given them a promise. He said he would restore them to the land after 70 years were complete. In other words, he's not going to cast them out of his sight forever, but he will restore them. In Jeremiah 29, verses 10 through 14, it says, Thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you to the place from which I cause you to be carried away captive. In 538 B.C., God moved upon a, a king by the name of Cyrus, the king of Persia, to allow the Jews to return to Israel. Now, Cyrus died in 529 B.C. and was ultimately replaced by Darius in 522. So when you read the book of Ezra, it begins in chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, by saying this, In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth the Lord God of heaven has given to me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is among you of all his people? May his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is God, which is in Jerusalem. And whoever is left in any place where he dwells, let the men of his place help him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, besides the free will offerings for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. So in the 70 years, that, uh, that they were in Babylon, many had forgotten their Jewish identity. Many children who were being raised in Babylon had become naturalized Babylonians. There's obviously a spiritual um, connection to that, by the way, by way of application. You know, we had what was called a revival called the Jesus Movement. And we came out of, of sin and we began moving in the ways of the Lord in a tremendous way. And that you raise your children up, and, and not every person who came out of the Jesus movement and was saved, not every one of them has believing children. Uh, what happened in the time of Israel is the people of Israel had gone into Babylon, and some of them had remained faithful to the God of their fathers, but the children who were being raised up, and you need to remember there's 70 years of this, had become naturalized Babylonians. They, they adopted the dress and the culture, the language and everything that was Babylonian. So they didn't retain, not as a huge group, they didn't retain their Jewish identity. Now, there were those who refused to become Babylonians. You read stories of Daniel and his friends. They refused to become Babylonians, but many had given into the temptation. And a generation arose ignorant of the ways of God, and they did not have a genuine love for the nation of Israel. They didn't love the land. So when you read the book of Ezra in chapter 2, verses 64 and 65, uh, those verses record that 49,897 actually returned to Israel when they were allowed to. And those may have been the financially poor, 
they had nothing to lose in returning to Israel. So under Zerubbabel, the remnant returned and rebuilding began around 536. And when you read Ezra chapters 3 and 4, Ezra 3 and 4 records that they began rebuilding the temple, but the work stopped. Now, two things combined to stop the work. One, there was continual organized opposition from their neighbors, especially by a group called the Samaritans. In Ezra 4, verses 4 and 5, it says, The people of the land tried to discourage the people of Judah. They troubled them in building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. And so it was a continual opposition organized against them. And second, apathy and discouragement on the part of the people took place. And what happens? Well, the work stops for 16 years. 16 years they refused to do the work that they had been called to do. So God raises up prophets. One is named Haggai. The other was Zechariah. And they were to do two basic things. One, they were to stir the people to rebuild the temple. And two, they were to stir the people to rebuild their spiritual lives. Now, why was it so important for them to finish rebuilding the temple? Well, we need to remember what the temple is. The temple is the place in the Old Testament where God would meet with man. When, when the temple was built, God was speaking to Solomon, who was given permission to build the temple. Solomon was the son of King David, as you know, and King David was a man after God's own heart. And, and David had, had, had come to realize that he dwelt in a house made of cedar while the ark of God was in a tent. And he said, this is not right that I should live like this. Well the, well, the, well, the ark is, is in a portable tabernacle. And, and he had said it to his prophet. And the prophet said to him, whatever's in your heart, go ahead and do it. And so David made plans and he put away money and he was going to build the temple. But the Lord spoke through the prophet and the prophet came back and spoke to David. And he said, thus saith the Lord, paraphrasing, have I ever asked you to build me a temple? Have I ever asked, you know, what you do is right in your heart. It's a good thing. But you're not going to build it for me. Because, David, you are a man of war, and your hands are filled with blood. So I'm not going to have you build the temple for me. Your son will build the temple. And so the one who was given permission to was Solomon. David put away a lot of money out of his personal assets as well as the nation of Israel's taxes. He had put away a lot of money. And he also has had the plans for the temple but he was never able to build it himself. That honor went to his son Solomon. And Solomon built the temple. And when Solomon built that temple, uh, Solomon was praying and the Lord spoke to him. It's found in 1 Kings 8, verse 3. And the Lord said to Solomon, I have heard your prayer and your supplication that you have made before me. I have consecrated this house which you have built to put my name there forever. And my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. So this was a place that God said, I will keep my eye on and my affection on. And this is where the nation of Israel will meet with their God. Well, their failure to rebuild the temple revealed their spiritual apathy. And so you have the book of Haggai through the prophet Haggai speaking concerning this failure. And that's what we're looking at here as we look at the book of Haggai as the Lord begins to speak to the nation concerning these things. And so in verses 1 and 2, In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shaltiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the, the high priest, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says, the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Sixteen years and you're saying it's not time. Sixteen years you've been in spiritual apathy. Sixteen years and you're saying, yet yeah, it's still not time to build this. You see, Zerubbabel, as is mentioned here, as well as Joshua, Zerubbabel and Joshua had uh, led the exiles uh, back to Israel. And, and they had encouraged the rebuilding but they had ceased in directing and leading the people in its reconstruction or its rebuilding. So God sent 
Haggai, as well as Zechariah, in order to stir them up to return to the work. And, and that's what's going on here. So in verse 2, it says, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people are saying it's not time to do that. What had happened is they had become indifferent because they were discouraged by the continuous opposition. And again, the Samaritans had been in opposition to them and had been accusing uh, the Jews to the uh, authorities, that accusing them of rebellion. And they had told the king that the Jews would not pay ta taxes, would not pay custom, nor would they give tribute, according to Ezra 4.13. In other words, these people have no value because they're not supporting the nation. These people shouldn't be given any privileges whatsoever. As a matter of fact, you want to see these people as being anti-government. You should see them as being in opposition to you rather than those whom you bless. There are people today who bring it up to 21st century. There are people today who say that kind of thing about the church. They'll say, these nonprofit organizations should not be supported or given any opportunity to get tax write-offs or any benefits at all. What good are they anyway? It's the same mentality, a similar mentality at least at that time. They're saying these people aren't supporting, they don't pay taxes, custom, or tribute. And so they're accusing them of rebellion, and, and, and that's something that is a very serious charge. In Ezra 4.15 uh, they say to the king, you will find in the book of the records and know that this city is a rebellious city, harmful to kings and provinces, and that they have incited sedition within the city in former times for which, uh, for which cause the city was destroyed. You need to know that these people are rebellious and they incite riot. You need to understand, one, is they don't have the right to have any nonprofit status, if you will. And two, you need to know that they're terrorists. They're, they're people that you shouldn't, um, you shouldn't support in the least. They disturb the peace of our neighborhood. Uh, they want to be moral censors of our nation. We hear those kinds of things to this day also. And so what happens is many of the Jews are afraid right from the beginning of the project. According to Ezra 3, verse 3, fear had come upon them because of the people of those countries. Under the continued threats and the discouragement, they'd grown tired. And the pressure had resulted in them becoming self-centered. So they're saying something that God speaks to them about in verse 2. This people says, the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Well, that reveals one thing. That reveals that they knew that it should be done, but they were putting it off. It should be done but it will be done at a safe and more convenient time. It's just not the right time is what they're saying. But the question has to be asked then, when is it the right time? If it's not now, when's it going to be? And so God is repeating to them what they're saying amongst themselves. And so verse 3, the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet saying, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You've sown much and bring in little. You eat, but do not have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one's warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put them, to put into a bag with holes. Does that sound familiar to anybody? You're getting money and you're dropping it and you're losing it as fast as you make it. So the word of the Lord comes by Haggai. And so instead of rebuilding God's house, he says, instead of doing the work on my home, you're building yourself custom, custom homes. That's what he means in verse 4 when he says, you've been saying the time has not come. So here's my question to you. Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses? The term paneled houses is another way of speaking of custom homes. You're building yourself very nice homes and neglecting the temple. You're using my money because all money belongs to him. You're using my money for your own comfort, and you're still saying it's just not the right time to build the temple. If we were to speed it up, perhaps the Lord could say, you have your new furniture, you have your 75-inch TV with surround sound, your stereos and your additions, your pools and recreation rooms. 
but you're saying it's just not time to finish the temple. And that's what he's saying to the people. And so in verse 5, therefore says, uh, thou says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. When he says consider your ways, the word consider literally speaks of thinking deeply. He's saying set your heart upon your ways. What you have done, what you have suffered, your present projects, and the consequences of neglecting me. Think deeply about that. Ponder well the course you have taken and the success of it, what you've designed, how you succeeded, what care, what disappointment, what labor, and how fruitless your labor has been. Consider what this attitude has led to. You see, remember, it was not the building of the temple alone, but what it was for. And he's saying, you've neglected your relationship with God, and you have become obsessed with self and obsessed materially. And what has been the result? Verse 6, you have sown much, bring in little. You eat, but do not have enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, no one's warm, and he who earns wages, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. This is what you have gotten. You work, you eat, you drink, you buy clothing, you try to save, but it's all gone in a moment. And what is he saying here? Your priorities must be reordered. You need to understand God's kingdom comes first. In Matthew, 60, uh, Matthew 6, verses 31 through 33, remember what Jesus said? He says, therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness. All these things will be added to you. Those are words of faith. You know, when you read this, and by the way, every time I see this, I can't help but think of the way that we, uh, we in the United States, um, the way commercials are, are crafted that are normally promising things that they say you want. And uh, perhaps you, you have a, a basic need for it, but they'll say that if you have these things, these are the things that will satisfy you. And they're normally the things that Jesus was speaking about. Uh, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? That's a lot of our commercials today, aren't they? I mean, if you watch TV at all, that's what you're, you're being told where to eat, you're being told what to drink, and you're being told what to put on. That's exactly what our commercials are. All you have to do is watch them. I don't encourage you to, but if you do, you'll see it. It's true, because those are basic things that every human being has a tendency of thinking about. And Jesus said, you need to understand that your heavenly father knows you need these things. He, he knows the things that you have need of. He knows what you need before you even realize it yourself. He knows what you need before you even think to ask him. He's already aware of it. Even before you speak, he's already heard. He knows what you need. Now here, this is so basic, and yet this is one of the areas that the nation of Israel forgot, and it's obviously one of the areas that, that contemporary Christians forget too. We, we construct entire theologies that give us promises to meet our carnal needs. When in reality, what the Lord Jesus Christ said, those are the things that heathens are constantly pursuing. Those are the things that the heathen wants, and the church is falling into the same trap that was going on in the time of Haggai. It's not time. It's not time. It's not time to put the Lord first because we have our own needs is really the cry of the church today in many quarters. It really is. And there are a lot of large assemblies of uh, professing Christians who gather to hear that message every, every week. Promises of health and promises of prosperity, promises that you'll always have a great day and you'll never go through a deep trial. You hear that all the time. If you don't hear it, congratulations, because you're not watching Christian TV. Because you see it on TV all the time. My wife, Marie, I'll, I'll, on occasion, I'll turn it on. I'll turn on a program, 
And my wife will say, what are you doing? One of the first things she'll say, what are you doing? I said, this is looking. She goes, you know what that does to you? Gets me mad. I say, yeah, I know. I, know, I just want to know what they're up to. She said, you, you know better than that. And then you'll hear me, I can't believe this. What? And just turn it off, turn it off. But what happens is that's what's happened today. Listen, the deeper lessons that you're going to learn very often come through the deepest struggles you go through. Don't forget that, please. Don't, don't kick against the prod. There are times that you are going to go through some very deep things. Understand that those are the things that the Lord allows you to enter into so very often because he's answering your prayer when you said, I want to be more like you. He's answering your prayer. When you said, God, purify my heart, how do you think that's going to take place? With him having, you know, some guy come up with the Reader's Digest, you know, you, you, you know you're going to $10,000 a day for the rest of your life. It doesn't come that way. It, it, the spiritual growth comes when you come to the end of yourself. And when you come to realize that without him, you can do nothing. It, it, it comes as you journey through the, the valley of the shadow of death. Because as you're doing that, that's when you learn, you will never leave me nor forsake me. That's when you learn that his rod and his staff, they actually do comfort you. That's when you learn the deeper things of the Lord. That's one of the reasons why so many of the saints in the Old Testament, you'll see their stories. Uh, found themselves in wildernesses. People like Moses, 40 years in a wilderness, 40 years. You know, a man who was being raised to be the Pharaoh of Egypt, who was learned in all the wisdom and knowledge of the Egyptians, a man who was spoiled for almost 40 years of his life. And now he's, he's banished to the backside of the, of the wilderness, and, and all he's got are stinky sheep. To, to keep him company. And yet it's in the midst of that, after 40 years of that exile, that he comes to realize that there's something greater than himself, that there's some, someone in this universe that is greater than he's ever really understood. And that's when the Lord there in that, in that shrub that doesn't burn, that's when the Lord calls him over, attracts his attention, and puts him into the ministry and says, you're ready. And, and his response to all of that through all those years in the wilderness is simply to say, but I can't speak. He finally came to realize that the things he had to say were not valuable. And that really matters is what the Lord would ultimately have to say. And that's when you watch the story. You know the story. I'm just saying things you know already. That's why he points to his brother Aaron and says, use him. The Lord says, because he says, because I can't speak. And that's when God speaks to him and says, who formed your mouth? Don't tell me you can't speak. We're told in Acts chapter 7, he was very eloquent. He was somebody who knew how to speak, but he couldn't represent the Lord because he wasn't in the right place to do that. He had to be broken in order to be usable. And that's how it works in our lives. And the Lord has a way of bringing us to that place. And he'll say, consider your ways. Look at what you've done. Look at where you're at and ask yourself, how did I get here? Is it time for you to take pleasure in life and to neglect your relationship with me? I sent you back. I put it in your heart to go back. You came back. I gave you a task. Reconstruct, rebuild the temple, the beautiful temple that Solomon had built. But you got discouraged, the opposition, the threats. And you went to living, just living your life, and you have neglected your first things. So you need to put your spiritual life back in perspective. What he's actually saying is you need to repent. That's what he's saying when he says, consider your ways. In verse 7, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. Well, there are forests surrounding Jerusalem. Go, cut down trees, build the temple. The foundations have been laid, but the work isn't finished. 
So in other words, what you need to do is come back to first things. Remind yourself, why did you return in the first place? Why did you leave Babylon and come back? So return to first things. Again, Revelation chapter 2, verses 2 through 5. Jesus is speaking, and he says this. He says, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. And so he's speaking to the church of Ephesus, and he's telling them that there are certain qualities that you have, but you have forgotten your entire purpose. You've forgotten why you exist in the first place. And his call to him to them is... is uh, to remember, because he says you need to remember where you've fallen. He said, I have this against you. So he uses the word remember, then he uses the word repent, and then he, he gives to us the concept of returning. So you need to remember, you need to repent, and you need to return. And so he's basically saying a similar thing to these people here during the time of Haggai. In verse 9, he says, you have looked for much, but indeed, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts? Because of my house that is in ruins, while well, every one of you runs to his own house. You have put in tremendous effort to live comfortably and prosperously. You have put in long hours to get ahead, but you haven't made any progress. You put in a lot of overtime, but you've gotten nowhere. You've given up everything, and it hasn't paid off. You, there was an old song called Mr. Businessman so many years ago. Oh, you wouldn't remember, but it comes to mind even as I'm reading this. Because this guy had worked and labored, and he had put in so much time, the song says, to get ahead. He said, you haven't even taken the time to smell the roses in your garden. You haven't even watched your children as they play. You are so busy trying to get ahead, but in fact, you're getting nowhere. And, and that's still true to this day, isn't it? I mean, you can work a lot of overtime, and your uncle takes it from you, Uncle Sam, in taxes, right? You put in all this overtime, and it ends up just, just going into, because you get into a new taxable income level. And all that you worked so hard to get to, that point, you end up losing it, most of it. You know, when I was, when I was a young man, you know what my goal in life as an employee was? It was to make $5 an hour. One of these days, because that's $200 a week. And that may not sound like much to you, but at that time, I was paying $74 a month for a car, a new car. And my, my rent was $180, $180 a month. So man, if I was making $200 a week, I would make almost $11,000 a year. I would be rolling. I would be rolling. <laughs> That's how I thought. And guess what? You finally make your five bucks an hour, and that carrot, it, well, it takes a step a little bit further. And now you have to make seven and a half dollars. And you finally work until you're making seven and a half dollars. And then it just goes a little bit further. When I was graduating from high school, my father said to me, if you get on the honor roll, I will buy you a brand new Mustang, a brand new 1968 Mustang cost $2,300. Yeah. I didn't make the honor roll. <laughs> so 
See, my dad and my mom bought their first house, their only house, no, they had two, their first house, they bought their first house for $9,000. My dad made $45 a week when he qualified for a $9,000 home. Think about that for a minute. Think about that for a minute. That same home that he sold for $100,000 30 years later would now go for probably about 500000 at least right now. See, so this carrot that's always in front of us, if we, just, if we just work a little more, if we give up just a little bit more, we can have that one day. The Lord is says, you know, he's saying, you take your money, you drop it into a bag, and it's got holes in it. You're actually gaining nothing. Why? Because you haven't put me first. You've neglected your relationship with me because you're thinking materially you're going to feel better about life when in fact you'll never feel better about life because of material blessings, but you will always feel better about life when you have a relationship with me. So instead of neglecting the temple where I will meet with you, you're busy building paneled homes. But consider your ways. What has it profited you? It hasn't profited at all. You put in all these long hours, but you're not making progress. And in fact, you are actually reaping what you've been sowing. In Galatians 6, 7, and 8, do not be, be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Verse 10, therefore, the heavens above you withhold the dew and the earth withholds its fruit. For I called for a drought on the land and the mountains, on the grain and the new wine and the oil, on whatever the ground brings forth, on men and livestock and on all the labor of your hands. In other words, I have withdrawn my hand of blessing from you because you've neglected your relationship with me. It's interesting how he speaks concerning the rain when he says in verse 11 that he had called for a drought. That's speaking concerning the withholding of rain. And when you think about rain, you need to remember that in the old as well as the new, rain is often used as a symbol of God's grace. He's saying, my grace is being withheld from you because of your sin. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, Jesus said, speaking of his father, he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. It's a picture of grace. And he's saying, I have withheld the rain. When you look in the law, and God had stated, when you're not walking right with me, in the book of Deuteronomy, he says, I will withhold the rain from you. Chapters 27 and 28. I will withhold it. And he's saying, I'm simply keeping my word. Well, verse 12, then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the presence of the Lord. And Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke the Lord's message to the people, saying, I'm with you, says the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. The result of bringing the word, conviction. A conviction that awakened a proper fear of the Lord in the people they realized that the Lord was speaking to them through Haggai. See, they, they didn't argue with him. They didn't say to him, oh, you're so harsh, you're so judgmental. You don't understand our pain. You know, we have to be careful, especially in this generation. We have to be careful in this day because very often when the word of God goes forth in a way that cuts our heart, the first thing we want to do is attack the one who brought it to us. When in fact, if we listen to what the Lord is saying and the spirit of the Lord is in that word, the wisest thing I can do is listen. The wisest thing. I was in 
Biola College back in the 70s, and, and I was in a chapel, and the guest speaker got up in a Christian college, and he said something to the effect, don't worry about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. The gifts have ceased. They're not in operation today. And as I was seated there, I, I, I got... See, that's funny. I believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and I got in the flesh. <laughs> How ironic is that? And I, and, I, I, and I sat up, and I go, and my friend who was seated next to me was a Baptist youth, youth pastor, a good friend of mine. He believed that the gifts did not operate, and he knew that I believe in the baptism of the Spirit of God and the gifts of the Spirit. He knew that. And he saw me sit up like that. He saw me. And I'll never forget how he tapped my shoulder. His name is John. He tapped my shoulder. And he said this. I've never forgotten. He said, just because you disagree with one thing that he said, don't throw everything out that he's saying. That was the lesson I learned at the age of 23. I may not agree 100% with anybody. And I never will. I don't even agree with myself. I fight myself all the time. <laughs> But just because one of the things they said are, is something I, I don't agree with doesn't mean that he's not saying things that are biblically solid. See, I understand what it's like to have somebody say something in a college campus that you don't agree with. But what is happening today in college campuses is if I don't agree with you, you don't even have the right to speak it. So we'll riot and we'll protest and we'll try and keep you from saying things that hurt our feelings. Listen, when the Spirit of the Lord speaks, the wisest thing you can do is listen. The wisest thing. And when the Lord through Haggai disturbed the people, they listened. From the leaders to the people, they said, this is right. We need to get busy doing the things of the Lord. This is true. So conviction awakened them. And they knew that this was the word of the Lord, and they responded like that. In the New Testament, 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13, Paul said, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God which also effectively works in you who believe. You welcome the word of God, and he has his effect in your life. So the real work for God begins with conviction that results in obedience. Human exhortation alone doesn't change hearts. You can use guilt if you'd like. You can find ways to manipulate if you want. You can develop a system of rewards or work incentives. You can nag and you can push, but that doesn't change a person's heart. What had happened is God had gotten their attention, and they knew that their, condition, uh, their conditions were the result of sin and negligence. So that's called Holy Spirit conviction. And this conviction produced a fear of God. And as this takes place, verse 13, Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke the Lord's message to the people, saying, I am with you, says the Lord. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel and Joshua and the remnant. God stirred them up. You see, the Lord told them that he had not abandoned them. And he was saying, no, I'm still with you. And he stirred them up. God gave them a strong impulse to fulfill his will. And he began through inspiring the leaders. And then he inspired the people. And as he inspired the leaders and he inspired the people, they went to work. And they went to work immediately. And we're going to stop here tonight. I'm actually doing something unusual. I'm not taking you that long. I'm slowing down and closing here. And with a couple of last words, and then we'll pray, we'll close chapter 1. Let the Holy Spirit bring conviction in your life.
Let the Holy Spirit bring conviction in your life. I'll say it again. Don't be oversensitive. Don't get hurt feelings when the Lord, through his word and by his spirit, points out areas of your life that need to change. Don't get overly sensitive and think, oh, I feel judged or unloved. That's not true. God's words are pure words. And when the Lord works in our, our life, very often what he does is he reduces us so he can build us up. And very often what happens is we, when we're reduced to nothing, come to realize that without him we can do nothing. And if you have ever prayed and ever sought the Lord and ever said to God, make me like you, remember that he will fulfill that, that prayer because that's according to his will. And remember also that his work in your life can take time. You don't ask God to make you into a great person in him. You don't say, God, make me a mighty individual in you. And then the next morning you wake up a mighty individual. The next morning you wake up the same skunky person you were the night you went to bed. <laughs> but what happens is the Lord, the Lord begins, the Lord begins to peel away those things that he's not pleased with. It's, it's, it's not easy. I don't know that my own spiritual growth has ever been easy. It's not easy. As a matter of fact, in many ways, my growth has been very painful because many of the things that I wanted to keep as pets were things that he wanted to exterminate. Years ago, a lady in this church, maybe 30 years ago, a lady in this church gave my children a present. She gave it to me. She said, could you give it to your boys? I think they'd like this. It was a cup, and it had a screen over it. And I really didn't look at what it was. She said, I think they'll like these. I didn't look at it. I brought it home from church. I mean, she actually brought this gift to church and gave it to me after service, and she said, this is for your boys. I think they'll like them. I brought them home, and I said, boys, you were given something. They were cockroaches. <laughs> no, really, they were cockroaches. So I gave them to my kids because <laughs> she asked me to, and she said, I think they'll like them. And three days later, they had chewed through the mesh yeah, and they got out in the house. Why did I tell you that? <laughs> some things that people think are good are really not, and some things have to be eliminated. And I got my friend, Dr. Raid, and I never told her that I killed her present. Some things that you may have in your life you may think that they're fine and you can live with those things because after all, that's who you are, right? That's what, you, that's what makes you who you are. Yeah, I get mad, but I'm Latino. Latinos get mad. We've got tempers, right? Right? Yeah. We, can, we can say that about our pet sins. If you don't like me this way, it's too bad. I'm not going to change. We can do that, can't we? But these things, these tempers, or these, these sinful little habits, these hidden sins are destroying our walks with God. So when the Lord brings conviction, be wise, be wise, receive, confess, turn, and watch him bless. Because he does. Because he doesn't bring conviction to harm you. He brings conviction to change you. Understand that. Understand that. Don't say to the Lord, I'll listen to you at a more convenient time when I'm ready. Haggai came and said, oh, is it time for you to live this way when God, whom you're supposed to be worshiping, is being neglected? Is it time for that? Is that what you're saying? Consider your ways. It's not time for that. It's time for you to be right with him. Well, that's to us too, isn't it? That's to me. That's to us. I want to bless you, the Lord could say. 
but you need to understand that where you're at right now, you're reaping what you're sowing. You're working so hard to get ahead, and you're always a step back, always, because you're not walking in step with me. Now, that's mercy from the Lord. That's not harsh. That's love from God. That's not mean. And that's why when I read books like this, and that's why I wanted to bring this to us, because I really feel that the Lord wants to do cleaning in our hearts too. And so may the Lord use his word in our lives to help us keep our eyes on him.